The following program is another in a series of Backstory special event coverage that expands on topics of politics, public health, and contemporary issues. I'll say thank you for the nice introduction. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you to all of you for being here. And I hope before I'm done, I can show you that there's a different way to think about this crisis you've been fighting. Dr. Michael Goldberg is a UCLA graduate researcher and practicing pediatrician who makes the medical assertion that autism is to a large degree a viral disease that affects the immune system, which in turn creates inflammation in the brain, giving rise to so-called autism spectrum disorder that is reaching epidemic proportions in our society today. And if you start to bring this together, look at the big picture it'll make a lot more sense. So there is a new effort beginning. The parents group have created a website for quite a while now, nids.net. And this talk, I hope, is going to lead into an effort that we want to bring parents from all these labels together under the one simple truth that will stand up. Your children are ill. Dr. Goldberg spoke to a gathering of physicians, clinicians, and concerned parents on June 2, 2013 at the Las Lomas Community Center in Irvine. This special presentation is one hour in length. Let's see what we can do about this. Now, those of you who are professionals know this. Those of you who are parents, I just want to bring up. If we're going to fix this problem, if we're going to make it change, we have to get back to what we call good basic science. Basic science says there are body systems. We learn this in medical school. If something is going wrong, what system is breaking down? And as is obvious, we have an immune system out there. We have a neurosystem. And the things we're going to talk about today are all tied into that. We also learn, this is something that seems to sadly have been forgotten by many of the experts out there today. If those body systems break down, there are only certain ways that can occur. And within those ways, you have essentially on all the children we are talking about, you have ruled out metabolic. I promise you they can keep talking about it but this is not a genetic disorder of any kind that we learned about in medical school. We don't, you're, thankfully, these children do not have tumors, brain trauma, physical insult. So what are you left with? You're left with infections. You're left with immune. And oh, this vague term, well, anything we couldn't validate or show something physical was psychological. So I hope by the time I'm done today, I would like to show you that what they're trying to call DSM psychological, there's loads of research supporting your children have a physical disorder. Now, you come to the brain, same principle. As a pediatrician, I try to approach any new patient. As a doctor, what happened? Was there any stress or injury during a pregnancy? Was that baby born in any way with some type of a structural abnormality? Is there some congenital malformation? Is there a vascular malformation? Is there injury? Thankfully, no tumors. Again, is there a metabolic disease? These children don't have it. And when you're done, looking at your children as a doctor, not a psychiatrist, a doctor, you're left with they are dysfunctional, something is wrong, and the only methods left are infectious. Isn't it interesting that I was taught in medical school, herpes viruses go to the temporal lobe. Dr. Ross, I think, will support that in our basic training. And with the evolution of HIV, the only nice word you can really say about HIV is it opened the door to research that opened a whole new field, which we should be looking at, called neuroimmune. Now, 
over the last three decades, there's literally been an explosion of autoimmune diseases. This is out there in the medical peer-reviewed literature. Diabetes, um, allergies, irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, rheumatoid diseases. We know there's autoimmune links, I would argue viral links, to Alzheimer's, Parkinson, MS. Again, neuroimmune is being discussed routinely. But as I will show you, the people in charge are taking anything that isn't consistent to discredit what really is real. You've got to come together and help stop that. If you look, we all know this, Tourette's, autoimmune, OCD pandas, autoimmune, autism, multiple immune findings, chronic fatigue syndrome, ADHD, bipolar, but in every one of what is essentially DSM labels, as I will point out as we go, there'll be solid pieces of proof, pieces that I would argue as a doctor, how can you, with a straight face, ignore them? But on the other hand, they're brushed aside because the evidence is disputable. Now, it is well, well acknowledged in the literature. Children with complex medical disorders have complex allergies, immune findings. I want to point to something because this is an example of how we're ignoring a major finding. Here's a published peer review literature. It notes that they have low natural killer cells. At an NIH sponsored symposium, 1992, try 20 years ago, was the first discussion that when natural killer cells are low, you are prone to viral reactivations and you're prone to a little thing called cancer since your body is not defending itself. Now in the last 20 years, all sorts of immune related diseases are up. Unfortunately, all rates of cancer are up and yet we won't connect the dots that when a child shows stresses, they are very important in their long-term medical health. Presently, we have an enlarging group of children. They don't fit past concepts. And the important thing is to come to something I actually said many years ago. Let's stop fighting, whether it's due to a virus, a retrovirus. We know there's gonna be a genetic predisposition, whether that's gonna be linked to intelligence, linked to a propensity to autoimmune disease. We know that's gonna be, and certainly, as I will illustrate later, not in the way the system wants to keep doing it, but there's no question. The only way to understand this, to go back 30 years, is something has changed in our environment. It's setting up more and more adults for what you would think of as propensity to go into immune stress. But the point is, let's stop fighting and let's focus on the problem. If you take a look at this slide, and I apologize for the white, writing here. Under this bell curve, all sorts of labels, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, chronic fatigue, bipolar, adult ADD, in children, learning disorders, ADDs, pandas, seizures, Asperger, autism. Now we can spend the next 30 years, unfortunately, with a little thing called national healthcare coming, you do not have 30 years to sort this out for your children. But we could spend another 30, maybe 50 years studying all of this. But let's step back and do the big switch. We have a disease. This disease has different expressions. Let's study it, not from prove there's nothing wrong with that adult or child, but let's study it from what is wrong and how do we understand it, and most important, how do we fix it? Now, here we go back to, I will say, basic medical school 101. How about college 101? I dare say high school 101. You cannot have an epidemic of a genetic disorder. It is scientifically impossible. So this is one of the first switches that say all the people that are studying your children, 
all the researchers that say, this is a crisis, we want to get answers for you, but they don't want to go back to basic science. We've got an epidemic. We better figure out what's going on medically. Forgive me, and I do get angry. It's like lip service. We're going to study a crisis, but we're going to make sure we don't get you any new answers. This should be unacceptable to every parent and physician out there. Now take a look. Is it an epidemic? When I grew up, my mom was worried every spring. Would I die? Would I be paralyzed? When polio was at its height, one in 1,500 children, I think by basic arithmetic, one in 50 is only 30 times more prevalent, and yet your children are getting one thousandth the medical attention. It's all being analyzed under psychiatry. As people have said recently, I will give Dr. Ross another piece of credit. As I'm talking about DSM versus what we call ICD-9 medical, he said the words perfectly. We need to bring your children to a different playing field. You've been playing in a sandbox called DSM psychiatric. Let's take them back to the right place, medical, medical illness, and then get researchers who are going to figure out that illness, not keep psychoanalyzing your children. I will show you later, much to my complete shock, they come out with a statement, up to one in five children have a mental disorder in this country. Well, look, when we were growing up, if one in 10 kids had a mental disorder, I don't think we'd all be here today. How can they go one in five and we're just gonna study it? My wife has expressed major fears that who's gonna take care of us when we get older. It's a problem. So I will argue we must have a disease process. And when you take this apart, the only disease process has got to be immune or viral related. Per Dr. Canner himself, now let, again, I'm going to keep saying, let's go back to logic and science. You'll hear that many times today. Dr. Canner was the expert. He came up with this ideal of a, something called autism. Actually, he and a few people were evolving this concept. What did he say? What separated a child with autism from not a medical disorder, not an infection, Schizophrenia. What do we think of schizophrenia? It's psychological, right? So look at him. He said the child with autism is never affectionate. Well, if we just went back to that definition, 99% of the kids we're calling autism would not have autism. The medical field might have to figure out why are those children not developing language? Why are they having motor issues? Why are they withdrawn? Why are they zony? But how can you use a diagnosis called autism that doesn't fit what the expert himself taught people? What was interesting, you can tell some of my frustrations in here, but when I go back and read Dr. Canner in the literature, many of you who are professionals may have even done this. You go back to the 40s, 50s, 60s. I would argue if he was standing here today, he would be leading the fight. These children do not have autism. He made the point, not once, not twice, but over and over and over again, the kid with autism was never normal. How can we rationalize? A child is born, healthy, bright, alert. Parents are thrilled to have a new baby. And then somewhere that kid falls into a zone. That's not autism, that's a disease. But unless you all can come together and fight this battle together, no one's gonna win against who's ever in charge out there. It's unbelievable. Now, this was another story. I wanna put this as unbelievable. We're talking pandas here today. I'll argue, by the way, I have to preface this. Every time I use the word autism, ADHD, chronic fatigue syndrome, pandas, you can interchange them because in the end, we're really talking neuroimmune. 
and what you have to do is come together and fight the points that they can't really dispute or shoot you down on. One of them is what I presented. If Cantor said that, what experts today have the right to change that? Then, when I heard this, the patients in my practice probably saw steam coming out of my ears. You had this epidemic outbreak in New York. First, there were 12 girls, 16, then 18, acting weird. Experts, one after the other, came out to pontificate what was wrong, suggested this is troubling. Maybe it's something within the community, or this is even a little crazier. Maybe it's something being perpetuated on the community. A neurologist in Boston who was given the green light to tell people, oh no, this is a conversion disorder. These children are hysteria. Now, forgive me, and I say this with all due respect, as guys growing up, we all know women are a little crazy, and maybe one or two teenage girls go over the edge. As a pediatrician, you might have to think, could it be something psychological, okay? But to think that 12, 16, 18 girls are gonna go over the edge, and we're gonna call it hysteria? This is the whole message I'm trying to deliver today. Stay on the fighting field they have you, and you can't win. Come to a new playing field called disease, and we might just succeed. Now, again, they speculate, was it waste? There was no toxin involved? At least people noted, well, wait a minute. Plenty of other girls had stress, family situations. They did okay. But that doesn't stop. If it's psychiatric, you can look at who has a problem, who doesn't have a problem, but you have no proof of why or what. Now, a Dr. Trifoletti got involved, tried to say the kids had some version of something called pandas, but as I'll point out in the literature, not every kid had the same blood work. As the system mobilized quickly to do, well, it's kind of vaguely formulated. We can't rule it in, rule it out. There's really no way to know whether they're working. It was an approach from, these girls are ill, we better figure out how to help them get them well. It was approached from, this is something called hysteria, and what can you do? Now, I'm bringing this up because this was another article by a reporter. She talked about the fact that we're now changing pandas to pans, and this is another trap for all of you. Look down here. Now it's any sudden onset neuropsychiatric disease. I said 30 years, we could probably spend 50 or 100 trying to figure that one out. But here's physiology, here's medicine. Here's what you all should realize. She talks about a mouse model. You give them strep, they get this induced, but now you take antibodies from that mouse, give them to another mouse, and they start acting weird too. Fighting about is it strep, is it mycoplasma, is it a, B, C, D is the mistake. We have to get back to the fact it's something neuroimmune and we better start to understand what part is affecting what child. I love this one. The neurologist said it couldn't be pandas because it's normally kids under 11. Forgive me again. But in a world I trained in, it couldn't be hysteria. You're not going to have 18 girls do this. So I come back to the fact. What kind of experts are we listening to? What I promise you, hysteria is far rarer than the possibility of pandas there. Now, how did we get here? I'm alluding to the fact that part of what you're all living with is our medical system has made mistakes. In the beginning, I thought they were purely accidental, ignorance. As time goes along, it's getting much harder to say. But let's look at the first mistake that puts you all here today. Back in 1984, there was an outbreak in Incline Village of a bunch of adults, mostly women, being tired, fatigued, 
couldn't think straight, what we would think of medically as a mono-like syndrome. They got investigated big time. Initially, the CDC experts said it was Epstein-Barr mono. Now, after eight or nine months, because the testing they did wouldn't confirm that each of those adults had Epstein-Barr, they had to backtrack. And I can argue, because of the high-powered place they were in, they don't like to have mud on their face. So when it wasn't really Epstein-Barr, oh, these adults are psychosomatic. It must be the yuppie flu. They're bright, intelligent people who are now malingering. As I will point out in multiple stories here, if you start back 30 years ago and figure out how many bright, intelligent adults became dysfunctional, how many children are dysfunctional, how many parents have become dysfunctional just trying to take care of their kids, what is this doing to our entire society? This has become untenable if we expect to be talking here five or 10 years from now. So let's go back, medical school 101. You get a virus, you get a vaccine, you go from zero to a high number, and then you come down to a low number. That is your body's way of protecting you, of remembering that exposure, of fighting back the next time you see that virus, okay? Now, again, if I trained UCLA 1970s, I will tease people, but it was not the 1700s, it was the 1970s, and we actually thought we were pretty good scientists then. I mean, we were pretty advanced. So how can anybody take a concept that we're taught goes up, comes down, and when these adults were walking around with sky-high titers, it all became psychosomatic. Well, if you can't show a viral titer elevation, then there is nothing wrong with those adults, is there? Except they're achy, they're tired, they're spacey, they can't think straight, but nothing's wrong. So, thankfully, I'm not alone. There are other physicians out there who still go back to how we trained. This is an article by Dr. Montoya that he took patients with chronic fatigue, elevated viral titers, treated them with a heavy antiviral, something called bancyclovir. 75% of those patients got better. He documented what we were taught in medical school. A titer alone doesn't prove you have a virus. But if that titer goes up or down fourfold, you've had that virus. Now he documented these titers dropped fourfold. To show you what you're up against, all your frustrations, a very prominent researcher I work with, NIH prof caliber professor, gets many grants through the NIH, openly told me, if we had applied to do that, we wouldn't have been allowed to do it. It was only Dr. Montoya's power that got that through. But isn't it interesting? Let's put money into the medical field. Let's stop donating to psychiatric. Let's put money physical. And one of the pediatric infectious disease specialists in his, de in his department would replicate this study in your children. It's not foreign to think of doing good science. Those people aren't being funded because that would change what you're being told. Look at this, and again, I don't, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but in chronic fatigue, over and over and over, they started talking about HHV-6, and this was really shocking. I started, some of the children, in fact, 35, 40% of the children who are being categorized as autism now have seizures. And this was unheard of 30 years ago. So that got me into a little more research, we had already known that HHV-6 was associated with febrile seizures. In other words, as pediatricians, we're first taught that a child is a little young, their brain system is immature, they get the right stress, they get the right fever, they have a seizure. Well, it turns out most of that 
is their experience with an organism called HHV6, okay? We know in the literature, HHV6 can live in what's part of the limbic system, temporal lobe. There's plenty of studies out there that say it leads to multiple sclerosis, myocarditis, encephalitis. On autopsy, they found, tempor they found HHV6 in the brain. Now I'm bringing this out to you because when I complain about psychiatry, it's as bad in neurology. Neurology is supposed to be MDs, physicians. I had parents coming in, one of them with the ability to say that she took her child to the top 10 pediatric neurologists in the entire country and every one of them told her her child was idiopathic. That's a polite way of saying in medicine, we don't know why. Now given, I will argue, you go to the seizure literature, on autopsy, between 25 to up to 40% of those children have herpes viruses in the temporal over their brain. How have we evolved to a medical system that experts with a straight face can tell a parent it's idiopathic and know they are missing 25 to 40% of the pathology. That's how bad we become. Now, you notice the statement at the bottom, conventional inflammatory changes are not found. As I have spoken about for many years, the striking thing about neuroimmune, started with adults with chronic fatigue, comes down to your children, is they don't give the markers for inflammation, high sed rates like somebody had rheumatoid or lupus. They give an unusually low sed rate, a zero, a one, or two. And this was taught to me, again, by wonderful scientists, that you literally, the brain is smart. There's no room to expand. So you get what's called a non-inflammatory inflammation. Isn't that interesting? So here is the research supporting that others have seen that. Now this was just another report, and I thought this was fascinating. This was a study. I don't know even how it originated, but they took children, just pediatric patients who had passed away, and they looked at their brain samples and found latent HHV6 in 30%, active HHV6 in 12 of them, how can we continue down a path that you all have children who are suffering, dysfunctional, not doing well, but these viruses don't exist to the people in charge? Unfortunately, when you go to the literature, the real medical literature, there are multiple articles that relate autism to viruses. In fact, part of what we put in the book, there are articles about normal people getting herpes viruses and becoming autistic. How much longer are we, and take autism as the extreme, how much longer are we gonna pretend this is something Canner called autism when it doesn't resemble his words at all? This shows you a spec scan and shows you why many people will hear me upset. This was a child doing very well. He was actually on his way to college. Um, he had been a chronic fatigue ADHD child and this was a good scan overall. This was his scan three years later as he's getting tired, spacey, zony, not fully taking care of himself when he went off to college. And the viral titers that had been in control went up now, in a system that wants to tell you those viral titers don't mean anything, look at this kid's brain when that virus was now active. We can get into fights, how much of this green is the virus, how much of it is stress on the brain, but that's what we should be studying. There is pathology, and this is not mental, I promise you. So, I learned, thankfully, many years ago, that spec scans do give us a tool to look at the brain. And while there has been much debate about spec, I have felt lucky that I learned 
Dr. Mena, ultimately Dr. Usurk, had access to a database where they used a weird thing called xenon. Why is that important? Because as I was told, I'm not a neurologist, I'm a pediatrician, but as I was taught, that allowed an absolute calibration of the blood flow in the brain, which is the one issue with SPEC. It's a computer. If you don't calibrate it right, you're gonna get funny looking values. And that's happened out there. But if you do it correctly, article after article notes the simple truth. Blood flow equals function. SPEC is not meant to diagnose absolutely a disorder, but it does diagnose what's working and not working in the brain. This is an example. The green areas you hear, see here are decreased flow. The red areas are too much flow. And you can use SPEC to identify problems. This happens to be a graphic idea of an autistic child. And isn't it interesting? Left temporal lobe, speech and language. Right temporal lobe, social. Gross motor with the cerebellum. This is not DSM psychiatry guessing. This is pathology. This is data that if we use it with your children, we might actually be able to figure them out and fix them. Now, I published with Dr. Mayna, Dr. Miller, that SPEC could serve as a way to define function objectively functional. When they tell you we can't quantitate studies, yeah, if all you want to do is base it on a bunch of symptoms, you're never going to quantitate that because they're going to change. I could take any one of you in the audience, and if you have a cold, I'll bet you'll have different symptoms than you may have right now. But it doesn't mean anything. We have to start looking at objective data and real function. Thankfully, Dr. Mayna, Dr. Miller were not alone. Other researchers have published spec data that also showed the temporal lobe playing a critical function in what we call autism. It's almost like if you take all of the children out there, again, let's use autism as the extreme. If they don't fit what Cantor said, if they have physical illness, motor issues, they're spacey, they're zony, they were normal, let's start looking at temporal lobe function, what's causing them to have autistic symptoms but it is a disease. This article left me, unfortunately, very frustrated, and many people know that about me. This came out in 2005. Simple arithmetic, that makes it almost eight years ago, you guys. The researchers I talked to, and you have to remember, I started off a little crazy. Hey, Mike, what are you talking about? Viruses, immune system, what's that got to do with autism? By the time we got to 2005, I had most of those people listening that the idea didn't make sense. And then this article comes out. Think about the lack of data. All the studies talking to you about autism are symptoms. They've changed those symptoms to fit what they want now, but they're still just symptoms. Here is a study that a little place back east called Johns Hopkins took brain material how we do things in medicine. They passed away for other reasons, a car accident, a drowning, and they looked at the brains of these children with autism. And what did they find? A neuroimmune response, more like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, AML, chronic microglial activation, famous words, innate immune response, and even this paper hasn't changed. You're all still in a playing field called DSM when this says those children unequivocally have a medical autoimmune illness. You see what it's going to come back to? You got to come together. You got to stop your own fights and come together under the one key. There's physical support. There's medical support. Your children are ill. Let's figure that out. Now, again, they talk about immune response in the brain. As little as th three or four years ago, the Mine Institute, Northern California, came out with, forgive me, 
what I would have to tell you is a major oxymoron. You have all of this research out there supporting immune system, I promise you. You can build piles of literature talking about immune abnormalities in these children. But instead of doing the one thing that would have helped every parent in this country, if they had merely said the truth, we have some weird immune disorder. We don't understand it. Some children have ADD symptoms. Some children have autistic symptoms. I will argue some ch children have panda symptoms. If they had said it that way, you would have all had the one thing you could have ever wished for in your life. If it's a disease that opens the door to the American pharmaceuticals spending hundreds of millions, maybe a billion dollars, to figure it out and fix it. But instead, what did they say? We have a new form of autism immune. That was slamming the door on all of your children. And forgive me, I get angry about that. Now, again, throughout the literature, loads of data showing inflammation. The only thing that gets scary, okay, is that you keep talking about inflammation, you keep looking at activation, and yet it's talked about like a side point. Doesn't mean anything. Hey, your kids have a mental disorder. They have pandas, they have autism, they have ADHD. None of these findings mean anything. And I will argue they're all there, okay? This was the article by Dr. Suedo summarizing the first 50 cases. I, again, will go back and say when she first said, hey, we have something called pandas, I thought that was wonderful. This was the mid-90s. That should have been the start of the NIH going, let's figure out neuroimmune. Instead, as I will show you 17 years later, you'll find an article that supports the idea of pandas, and then you'll find, oh, we can't really prove it, we can't really validate it. So Dr. Suedo put this article together. She talked about this as this was a legitimate subgroup of patients. They had characteristics we call pandas. And what I've done many years ago is say, okay, we can't win fighting this. I trained under excellent pediatricians. Literally, I'm proud of it today. They wrote textbooks in medicine. They led programs around the country. And I'm willing to say, let's get back to how I trained in the 1970s, maybe with a few new pieces of science from there, but the basic principles. And that, in so what I did was say, wait a minute, when I was in medical school is really where this problem all began. You learn, if a kid's got strep infection, Kids got measles, a kid's got rheumatic fever, a kid has diabetes. That's our job as a pediatrician to take care of that. That's a medical ICD-9 label. But wait a minute, if that kid has ADD, autism, schizophrenia, anything that was mental was not our job as pediatricians. It was its own category, DSM. So. Again, working with researchers trying to change this, came up with the concept, let's put a medical umbrella. Whether you want to call it NIDS, whether you call it anything that uses the words neuroimmune, the idea was let's bring this back under neuro, neuro as a medical state. Under that grouping, we could have subgroups. The kids can have autistic symptoms. The kids can have panda symptoms. The kids can have ADD symptoms. But if we put them under medical, who's gonna get funded to figure this out? Immunologists, researchers, people that will look at this infectious disease, you'll have a complete shift in how your kids are thought of and what's done. So we put together this idea, it didn't matter whatever the reasons are, whatever combinations of factor. In the end, you have an immune-mediated shutdown going on in the brain. And again, this is physiology. How do all of you feel when you get a cold? Zony, spacey, tired, right? I'm picking on a cold because a cold is a virus that we know doesn't go to your brain. 
So why do you feel that way? Well, again, let's throw out logic and science. We were designed, as they put it, intelligently. Your immune system knows you're fighting something. It actually shuts down blood flow to what are considered the critical areas of your brain, just happen to be in the temporal lobes, the higher learning centers of our brain. But fortunately, four or five days later, a week, you get better. Your brain opens up again. A simplistic way to start to research this and understand it is by some autoimmune mechanism that system stays shut down. As I put out many years ago, if that shutdown occurs when you're an adult, you're going to get variations of chronic fatigue, ADHD. If that shutdown occurs when you're a teenager, you may get chronic fatigue, ADD. If you're a younger child, ADD. But if you're a really young kid, autism, PDD. It's all going to come down to the same disorder, just when does it shut down those parts of the brain and how is it interfering with critical development in that child? So again, I do not care what name they come up with, but let's get a name that is under medical, ICD-9. Now, all of these things have that common linkage. If you look at autism, you look at OCD, Tourette's, PAN, CFIDS, all of this will be linked by that one common denominator. They have some component of a neuroimmune shutdown going on. If we start with that, we could fix this, figure it out. But look, I'm making complaints to all of you that just like you're upset with your children, I am upset that I trained under a medical system that can put a name for children called CDD. Do you see that down there? Do any of you know what CDD stands for? Childhood Disintegrative Disorder. Now, I have a little problem with that. I made a decision many years ago to become a pediatrician. Why did I choose to become a pediatrician? Because I was taught children had healthy protoplasm. Thankfully, there's people that want to work with adults, older people, thankfully. But I made a choice. I wanted to work with a child. If I was up at 3 in the morning, I wanted a kid who had the potential for many more years of life. I will tell you everything I'm talking about. This is all connected. How can any expert with a straight face give a child a label, they're disintegrating, and we just don't have a reason? That's about the biggest extreme I can take you all to. How are you going to solve pandas? How are you going to solve autism? How are you going to solve ADD when the people in charge think we have something called CDD? Now, this ties into a little bit of what you were talking about before I came up here. When you're talking about children that start to have trouble, and unfortunately, you all know these stories. How many children start off bright, intelligent, and they're now on welfare? They're now homeless? They can't take care of themselves? Well, this is all because we're not looking at these children medically. This was a great case many years ago. This child was actually, when I still had a regular practice, came in for his 18-year-old checkup, and I find out he's flunking out of high school. The parents are telling him he's lazy, unmotivated. The father literally is kicking him out of the house and telling him he's on his own. Now, I was just getting into this. I ran blood work. It gave me markers for these viruses markers for the immune system. I started working with him. One year later, this was his brain scan, and trust me, this is a whole lot healthier scan. And guess what? This lazy, unmotivated child was putting himself through college. Ultimately, the dad said, hey, you're a good guy. Put him through business school, and he's out there paying taxes and living a life. Now. We have ignored that by the system saying we're losing children pre-damaged. They're already special needs. We're completely ignoring the fact that we're losing productive young adults 
who are supposed to lead us into the future pay taxes and help us have an economy, not be dependent upon it. This was a scan that Dr. Main actually didn't like. Um, this was when the machine was giving us like a 3D image of the brain. And I only bring this out to illustrate. You don't really have holes in the brain, but as Dr. Miller said to me, Mike, this is black and white. You can change this process. Look at this scan over that one. And then put yourself in your children's position. You're trying to learn and those signals run into a dead end. I don't think most of us would have done too well in school if that was happening to our brains. Now, this is where we've evolved to. We can use spec, and this is one of the more current ones. I leave it to Dr. Usler to analyze the data. These are the data scans, but he can put it together on a database. And again, if we get a focus to use this, we can reach out around the country and start standardizing what we're doing and helping children. This shows a child doing pretty good. This scan shows a child not doing as well. Unfortunately, this one, you look at all this green and stuff there, is showing a child who really was not in a good place. But look at this. This child came to me December 2011. It's, again, I defer to Dr. Uzo on these readings, but it doesn't take a lot to see that by the time the cerebellum is coming into here, where is this kid's temporal lobes? You see how blue those are? What I was taught on a simplistic basis is by the time the cerebellum's coming in there, the temporal lobes are supposed to be functioning. So this is this child on his recovering fully on his way to regular classes, doing great. And look at this, the temporal lobes are in play. As Dr. Usler read this, you went from moderate hypoperfusion to minimal. How much longer are we gonna tell parents and children, we're really sorry, but we can't help you, when the truth is completely different? This is unfortunately the bad part of spec. Notice again, Dr. Uther is a nice guy. He gives me a little arrow here. Hey Mike, do you see that white, really hot area? Is this kid seizing? We can use spec to define what the brain is doing. And isn't it interesting that here's a child with seizures, question autism, low natural killer cells, low SED rate. He has a neuroimmune disease going on. If we start treating that child for a disease, we might preserve brain function. If we just leave him on anticonvulsants, there's no anticonvulsant out there that doesn't ultimately lower your IQ. How can we make that mistake with your children? So this is part of the problem, part of the mistakes. If you look at the data out there in the literature, you look at what I have in my clinical practice, there's all sorts of markers, ASO titers, changes in T cells, NK cells low, positive ANAs, low SED rates, some of these children beside IgG actually have IgM shifts on viruses, food screens shift to the right. The problem, I had Arnold Schwarzenegger actually help me with an introduction to the state of California to try to talk to the public health department here. Guess what? None of what I'm presenting to you meant anything. They wanted one test one marker that would define these children. That's like saying, we're not gonna do anything different because there's almost no autoimmune disease in life that has one marker that defines everybody. So this was very frustrating. I was actually given an introduction, a chance to try to help point the state differently and under a absolute wall was, well, you don't have one marker, it doesn't count. Now, this is what you run into, again, when we come to PANDAS. They actually proposed PANDAS was a new way to look at autoimmune disease in the brain. That was a very good observation, because it really is, okay? But isn't this interesting? Inflammatory changes in the basal ganglia. Now, I bring that out, because remember I said 
Doesn't matter what name I use, autism, ADHD, chronic fatigue, pandas. Well, on the, on the brain, the pathology is clearly overlapping. Dr. Usler many years ago noted that we had hyperness in the basal ganglia and that was due to inflammation. He and Dr. Maynard confirmed that. So part of pandas is that same inflammation. We're really giving your children an artificial subgroup. We're only going to define the ones that get triggered off by a strep. Let's start to look that if your child between episodes, and let's, I'm going to clarify this. If you have a child who gets triggered by strep, when he's well, is totally bright, totally alert, totally fine, that might be that really rare kid who is truly just strep triggered. But if you have a child, he gets worse with this, he or she gets worse with a strep, but when they're well, they're still reactive. They're still not in a normal place. They're still not bright and alert. That's a kid who's got something going on neuroimmune, and it's not just strep related. So, then you come up with, and this is what works against you. By the system we're living under, they want to study strep. So what do they find? Only five of 64 exacerbations were correlated to strep. 75% had no correlation. So what does that mean? Well, we have a subgroup who may be related to strep. This is not the most common anecdotal event. We need to study these subgroups. No, you all need to come together on one switch. Whatever these findings are, if a child is not bright, healthy, and alert, they're ill. We need to fix that before we have no well children left. So you come out with the things I said to you. Here's another study looking at immunology of Tourette's. And isn't it interesting, basoganglia, the lambic nuclei. When I got into this in the literature, I'm saying, well, this only confirms what we should already know clinically. This is a complete overlap. But another study, they actually showed children with pandas had similar executive dysfunction to children with OCD, Tourette's. But then the next report summarizes studies out there, and this is what does you all in. More than 85% of clinical exacerbations had no relationship to strep. There's no correlation clinical exac exacerbations and brain immunity. Oh, wait. It's even worse. Physicians in the community are diagnosing pandas without proof. So you put that together and we can ignore everything. Despite what I've told you about positively, this says that we still have to study a subset. You see? We need the switch. It doesn't matter what subset your children are in. They have a problem. And we, it's our job as physicians, researchers, therapists to fix them, not to say let's study them more. Now, again, I, I, I'll scan this. I don't want to keep, I want to leave time for a lot of questions. But all sorts of studies talking about microglial activation. There's been studies out there for years that you have pathology, schizophrenia, autism, OCD. You have to throw another discussion in here. We know there's a lot of adults who have immune and viral issues with Alzheimer's. Instead of a enlarging burden on society, how many of those adults could be treated if we also open the door to neuroimmune? It's like there's a wall. They don't want to touch this direction, and yet we're all going to go bankrupt if we don't fix it. Um, now, then you come back to, here's a report, pathogenic genetic neuroinflammation in psychiatric illnesses confirms it's all been reported, but I will argue again, nobody is pursuing that direction. You don't see anybody under psychiatry saying let's treat someone with Alzheimer's with an antiviral or look at immune issues. It's because it isn't everybody, they're going to do nothing for anybody. That's pretty sad. So here's a report that showed IgM antibodies also affecting basal ganglia, caudate nucleus. More directions that say the actual evidence, though, is still up for debate.
If Dr. Sueto started this, 1995, I think 17 years is enough time to debate this. It is time you all came together and put your foot down for the one truth in life. Your children are ill. You want infectious disease specialists, you want immunologists, you want pediatricians, you do not want psychiatrists categorizing your children. So what do we have? We have many children with DSM labels. They are in fact immune related disease. I would present that this can be diagnosed using blood tests and spec scans. And if it's a disease, we can modulate that, restore brain function, and get back to what I hope would be good pediatric practices for your children. This is one of the recent notes from a new patient. He tries to pedal his bicycle, but still can't do it. When did it get acceptable that multiple kids have physical limitations and that's somehow psychiatric still? How many children feel like this? And if you take away the psychiatric label, how much are we hurting these children when they can't do what they're supposed to? You know, please forgive me as I say it this way. If a child was really special needs, implication, forgive me, is mentally retarded, well, very sadly, that child wouldn't be aware of other things. But when these are children that are ill, in a system that's supposed to take care of your children, I would argue, bring this together. We're abusing these children to leave them the way they are. How many mothers know their children are ill? How many of you in this audience know your kids are ill but the system wants to deny it? Let's get back to medical school 1970. Listen to the mothers. Now given that that came from professors who, like I said, literally wrote textbooks in pediatrics, I happen to believe that's a really good principle to get back to. There's not one piece of data that says your children have been born the way they are. This is a slowly progressive disease. It comes back to the point I tried to make. Let's get the truth out there. Let's get a world that says we're losing children and maybe there will be a priority to fix all of your kids. And as I've shown, the concept, the ideal, this isn't changeable, is thankfully completely wrong. This scan helps to prove that. I thank all of you. I hope I've opened up some doors for different thinking. And obviously I have a goal, and that is before they lock us all off as doctors to standard of care, can we get enough families, enough parents to stand up and bring your children back to a medical world. We must do that.